everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager, and I get to be your host today. We are taking questions. Oh, our sponsor today is the Illinois Prairie Weavers. We appreciate this guild uh, sponsoring us today. They have a great logo, don't you think? I love their logo. Um, if you want to learn more about them, you can go to their website. But we do appreciate Illinois Prairie Weavers. Thank you for being our sponsor today. As always, we'll take questions at the last 15 minutes of the session. Please put them in the Q&A, not the chat. Uh, I have a hard time seeing them in chat. And we want to make sure we get your good questions. You can keep the chat going, though. We like those comments. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm so excited. We have Janice Lussman Moss. Janice is a weaver who embraces the unique vocabulary of digital design in relation to the binary functioning of threads on the loom to create her art. Her art. She has been awarded numerous individual artist fellowships from the Ohio Arts Council beginning in 1984 and received an Arts Midwest National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship and Crafts. Janice also won the prestigious Governor's Award for Arts in Ohio in 2016, the Cleveland Arts Prize Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019, and a coveted United States Artist Fellowship in 2019. Her work has been presented throughout the United States and internationally, and we'll talk some about that today. She also has a solo show currently at the Kent State University Museum. She is a Pittsburgh native and resides in Kent, Ohio, where she is the Emeritus Professor at Kent State University. Hi, Janice. Welcome. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And thank you for HGA for inviting me to participate in Textiles and Tea. This is really exciting for me. Oh, it's our honor. We'd love having you here. So we got to go to the most important question first. What is your favorite tea? Um, my favorite tea, I love black tea. Don't I am not a coffee drinker. So I drink black tea in the morning and in the afternoon, although usually in the afternoon I have it iced. Um, and it's always PG tips, gold label. Um, I like that's very strong tea and it uh, suits my taste buds. So that's my favorite. PG tips? PG tips. Yeah, oh, that's, that's a new one. That's a new the one. British uh, tea, uh, and you know, I didn't start drinking it in England. Um, but <laughs> it's I wanted a nice, strong black tea, and uh, I figured, well, the the Brits know where to get the best black tea. All right. Well, we want to start with how did you get started in fibers? Was it college before then? How did you get started? Um. You know, it was in uh, when I was at the university and it was kind of accidentally I had uh, studied, I began my studies in interior design and um, and then I kind of switched majors to art. I got married actually um, before I got involved with my textile major and my husband and I went off to school together at Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia at uh, Temple University. And uh, there was a, you know, textiles were offered in the School of Art, which had never, I'd never seen that before. I don't, you know, the more traditional kind of programs um, didn't have textiles. This was in 1977. So in fact, there was a little bit more textile activity than there probably is today, but um, nonetheless, it still wasn't, uh, you know, ev at every university. So I went to Tyler School of Art. I saw a listing for textile course, and I thought, oh, this sounds interesting. I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but I took the course, uh, and I wasn't immediately captivated, but by the end of the semester, I was. Um, I really loved the physicality of the medium. I loved the repetitive process. I loved building. Um, and it seemed so much more friendly to me, easier to use um, uh, to, to make something rather than to work with a blank sheet of paper and do a drawing or work with a blank canvas and do a painting. That's very intimidating. I know to a lot of people, and it was intimidating to me too. I never seemed to know where to start. So working with the materials, manipulating materials, working with accumulation um, allowed me to kind of transform those materials into meaning, um, into an object that had meaning. Um, and those processes also are embedded with metaphors. So, it, you know, it, 
it's just a fabulous medium and I fell in love and have been really involved ever since. I like that comparison of a blank canvas versus, versus starting with color and textiles and right. everything. Yeah, I never thought about that before. And you're right, a blank canvas is very intimidating. So yeah. that, that's a good point. That's a real good point. Well, you were, math is a real strong influence on your work. Were you a math major? Why did that become part of your artwork? I wasn't a math major and I never disliked math, but I never, you know, really had, had a great kind of uh, fondness for it. And I uh -huh. never took, I, you know, everybody takes their math in high school and that was it. That was as far as I went. Um, but, I, you know, it's something again about the building um, process. It's very architectural. It's very structured. It's very ordered. It's very systematic. So in order to kind of control those systems or, uh, you know, work with those systems, you need to work with math. Um, I love the geometry of weaving, you know, the grid, and I do work with a number of uh, matrix um, kind of uh, foundations of shapes, uh, matrices that, that I uh, impose on the grid, essentially. I, I always have um, worked with Circle, circular shapes and um, diamond shapes, of course, very strongly associated with the twill. But, you know, all those geometric shapes are very, they're symbolic. They mm -hmm. have, again, content. They have meaning. Um, they have, you know, sacred geometry and, and they have beauty as form. So I like the way that, it, you know, you can man, manipulate those kind of, um, geometric shapes within the field of that grid, which is our weaving, which is our warp and which is our weft. Um, I have always worked where I started to work with weaver controlled processes. So I was always manipulating the, the yarn as I was working. I wasn't relying on loom control, throwing from salvage to salvage my shuttle. I never did that. I always like to stop and start. And I would use different kinds of materials, some thick, some thin, I would use um, uh, different uh, structures and, you know, some would be twill, some would be plain weave. So there was always a lot of counting for me. And on my, on my loom, on my reed, I actually have my reed demarcated in inches so that I could, you know, easily find, well, fairly easily find where I needed to be at any given time to follow my design ideas. Um, I always work my designs out in um, uh, on graph paper so that I had that correspondence to my weaving. And um, so, you know, I, I made that kind of connection between the drawing and the weaving very directly through geometry, through counting, through numbers. Um, I also want to mention, I, I hope I'm not talking too much, Kathy, but um, your question. That's what you're here for. And, That's what you're here for. And they're very provoking um, and make me think a lot. But I also wanted to mention too that my interest in the random walk. And um, when I talk about what my, the meaning of my work, I mentioned the, the random walk, which is a mathematical theory. And the random walk is, is, is it's based in the notion, it's kind of everywhere. It's in life, it's in stock market predictions, it's in how our leaves grow on trees. It, it's, uh, it's about not moving forward, but moving to the right or to the left in a kind of a, a more random order. So I love that idea. Now the random walk, I, I first discovered it, through the Weave Maker program. And I don't know if you've ever used the Weave Maker software, but Weave Maker had a, um, an option for us weavers when we wanted to design our structures that we could you know, click on um, twills or we could step, click on step twills or we could click on summer and winter or we could click on random walk. And I thought, whoa, I love this idea and I'm a walker. So random walk, this is perfect. I love it. I thought it was some weaver's innovation. And so I started to do some research, like where did this come from? What weaver discovered the random walk? 
And I, I couldn't find anything. So I actually called the maker of the, um, the designer of the Weave Maker software, and I'm sorry, I forget his name, Dana. Um, but uh, he was fabulous. And he said, well, you know, I'm a mathematician. I designed the software, but it's a mathematical theory. It's not a weaving theory. And of course, you know, that just also really intrigued me. So I was very excited about that. Um, so math seems to be, you know, in all parts of the way I think and everything I do, math is there, numbers are there, counting are, is there, order is there, systems are there. I have not heard of that theory. Now I want to go find out about it. <laughs> it's, you it's know, all the math theories you hear, you know, Fibonacci and the golden. Yes. Like I've never heard of that one. Well, you know, you'll, if you do investigate it, I mean, it's a very deep theory. And math is, you know, I, I, I skim the surface. I am, I'm not a mathematician and I have such great admiration for people who, you know, get into numbers to such an extent. Um, but I, so you'll find a lot of information that's totally indecipherable. At least I couldn't decipher it. But I, and, and I talked to a mathematician at Kent State University and I was asking um, Chuck Gartland, I said, you know, can you help me like figure out some systems using the, the, the notion of the random walk? So he was actually, you know, of course, uh, working with this and that and all these numbers and I'm there. Ah. <laughs> but I, you know, I just love the visuals and I love the idea of kind of, you know, just moving in a more intuitive way. So the logic of weaving, that that underlying kind of precision um, is broken by this something that is just more, in my mind, intuitive or serendipitous. All right, everybody's running to their computer right now <laughs> and they're Googling this to find out about it. So I'll, I'll see some comments here. <laughs> well, speaking of walking, the next image we've got up is from Walking with My Shadow. It's a series that you did in 2021. And you talk about the characteristics, the parallel characteristics of walking and weaving, which I, it was kind of one of those things was like, yeah, okay, I get that. So how did you come up with the connection between walking and weaving? And would you expand on that connection? Sure. And, you know, it, it, it evolved. Um, again, when, the, when I discovered the random walk and started to think more directly of walking, I thought that was just so fantastic. But I've always thought of my compositions as kind of, um, I don't want to say illustrative, but capturing the essence of movement that I experience when I walk. And of course, walking is a slow movement. Um, I, walked, I walked to school every day um, when I was teaching and I still walk every day. Uh, I love walking, I love being outside and whether I'm going somewhere, if, if I have a destination, if I'm going to the market, I walk. Um, I have a rule that if it's, uh, if it's over a mile or if I'm gonna have to carry something more than five pounds um, home, then I can drive. Otherwise, I walk. So walking is very important to me in my life. It's slow. It allows you to be part of the world, to observe things very critically, very de in detail. Um, and weaving is the same. So, you know, it, the parallel, uh, thinking about weaving as advancing, you know, is slowly, um, you know, you move. When I weave, I might weave a couple inches a day because my weaving is fairly slow, even though I am using Jack Hard. It's always been two, three, four inches a day. Um, and so I have to kind of satisfy myself in some way that, you know, this, this is okay. It's not, it's not a race. I am enjoying the, mo the moment and I'm enjoying the experience. I'm enjoying the evolution of shape and form as I'm standing at my loom. Um, and much like when I'm walking and I'm looking at things, I'm paying attention to what's going on. I'm, I'm aware of the air, I'm aware of the fragrances, I'm aware of the wind, I'm aware of the grass, the leaves. And so I pay attention to details and I feel like that is such a, a, a gift. And that's what happens when you weave. You get to, to, to see things evolve slowly so you can be attentive 
to each little section of what you're doing. And I, I like that. I, I do too, I do too. Um, we're gonna come back to that with another question, but let me go to another um, series of works. And these are from Dancing with Distance. Mm -hmm. And this is on exhibit right now at Kent State University Museum. I hate it that we didn't interview you earlier because it's over this weekend. So if you're in the Ohio area, you can still see this exhibit at Kent State. But anyway, it's a solo exhibit. And so could you talk about the exhibit? But also, I'm real curious about how the name came about. It's an interesting name, Dancing with Distance. Um, it, it actually is Dancing with the Distance. Oh, I'm um, sorry, the Distance. But um, thank you. And, and for everybody to know that the deadline for my exhibition closing has been extended. Um, the curator called me on Friday and said, would you mind if we keep the, the show up through through December? And I said, no, that would be great. And I can announce to everybody today that the exhibition will be up longer than expected. If any guilds are in the area, wanna, wanna travel to Kent, Ohio to see the uh, wonderful Kent State University Museum and see my work, let me know, email me. I'd be happy to walk you through the show. Um, the, the, the title of the, the exhibition, Dancing with the Distance, is actually from a, uh, the title of a song that my husband wrote. And my husband, Al Moss, is a musician. Uh, he's a guitar player, uh, a songwriter, and primarily he's a pedal steel player. Um, and he wrote a song, it's uh, called Dancing with the Distance. And the chorus for that song goes from the way it is to way it was, what it doesn't do to what it does. From where I am to where I'd rather be, I'm dancing with the distance here between. And he wrote that song um, right as the pandemic was starting. And I thought it was so profound. It was almost as if he knew that something was gonna happen where he's, you know, where, from where I am to where I'd rather be, I'm dancing with the distance here between. And I loved it and it really resonated with me and it really inspired this series of weavings that I did dancing with the distance. Um, I had just gotten a new TC2 loom, a small one. I had a large one. I have, am so grateful for my fellowships that have allowed me, uh, given me the kind of the resources to purchase these fabulous tools. So I had just gotten a TC2 loom, a small one, a one module wide loom. And it's so exciting to work small um, because, you know, you can work more expediently and you can make discoveries very much more quickly. And it's really, I love, I love it. And, and so when the pandemic hit, actually, I had just put a warp on my loom and I was able to really concentrate, to focus in on these smaller works, um, only 14 inches wide. And they just developed into this series, which is my Dancing with the Distance series. Um, I know we're going to talk a little bit about materials in a while, but you notice that the introduction, I, I introduced metal into these weavings more dominantly, more predominantly than I had in the past. And I was really thinking about that kind of, that, that wire as, as creating, you know, shine, light, the sense of hope um, during that very you know, traumatic time. Um, and so, you know, it, everything just kind of came together. I, my husband has a studio right next to mine. I mean, we're in, we work in the house and so his is in the next room. And so I oftentimes hear him playing and singing and his, you know, the notion of music, the way music works for repetition, playing the same song over and over and over again, lyrics as he's writing something, you know, I'm hearing that over and over. And of course I'm in my studio working with this repetitive accumulative process. So there's a correspondence there and I love the way the music has, you know, that kind of quality of harmony and melody. And, and I think a lot about the relationships of music and dance to my compositions, as well as, you know, to this title. So when we're looking at this image, what is white? Is that metal reflecting light? Yeah, Kathy, thanks for pointing that out, because actually um, 
it is hard to tell and it's really difficult to document metal if any of you have used metal before. Um, it's so reflective, of course, that's why I love it. Um, but you can see with the overall image that there's some darkness to those shapes. So what's really interesting about that too is thinking about moving around the piece. You, you see different things as you are in front of it versus when you're on the right side versus when you're on the left side as you move. And, and I like the way that engages the viewer. Um, you know, you, if you stand only in one position, you will not get the full effect of the weaving. And that's probably true of every weaving because weavings are so textural and so fabulous. But nonetheless, um, it, it makes it even more apparent with metal. Well, your work takes you traveling anyway, when you, when you look at it. I mean, it's not like you can just look at one piece. It takes you somewhere else, either by the, the line or by the texture. So, Thank you know, you. I'm on a journey when I look at your work. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. I love it. And I, you know, certainly those are the kind of things that I would love to have happen with the viewer and anybody who, you know, gives the work the time that I think all art deserves you know you you can't absorb something by walking speedily past it you need to concentrate and um so yeah that's great thank you kathy oh, you're okay. as soon as i get off i'm going to google how far is kent state from yeah i would love it please i would ahead. love to see that i would love to see that and you know i'm sure they changed the date because of textiles and tea i'm sure it yes is. hey i'll take it all right <laughs> um now you stated, I love this statement because when you said that it was kind of like, oh, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> the uh, warp is a linear time. So would, I'm gonna say anything else about that. So would you just talk about what that means that the warp is linear time? Am I saying that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot about time. It As all processes, I talk about the metaphors of the processes and, you know, everything we do in textiles is very labor intensive, time intensive, and it reflects time through accumulation. So it's not just that we spend a lot of time doing it, it's that it, 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 it captures that time through, through, through accumulation. So as you weave and you loop, move along the, the tense warp, you are marking time that's linear time. It is essentially, the idea of a beginning and an end. And a warp has a beginning and an end, theoretically. I mean, it does technically or physically, but not really. So, you know, the other type of time, of course, is circular time and time on a clock because, you know, mm -hmm. we have 12 this afternoon and then we have 12 tomorrow afternoon. So it doesn't, it doesn't stop. Um, and, and I look at you know, although we're weaving from beginning to end, essentially, we never end at the same spot, right? I mean, we're learning the entire time we're, we're making. We are creating something, and when we get to the end of that creation, we remove that from the loom, we look at it, we get excited, and we say, this is what I want to do next. So, you know, it's all about learning and and absorbing and then taking that information and moving forward with it. It's a continuum. It, it keeps on going. Um, and so that's the idea of circular time. Linear time, that, that I mean, this, it's historical too. I don't know if you've done any reading about, um, you know, textile histories, but in, in other parts of the world, um, cultures do look at the warp as representing eternity as being something that is um, representing the spiritual aspect of life, something that is unchanging, whereas the weft is more transitory, something that kind of comes and goes, something that is moving in and out of that permanent thing. Um, and oh, I love that. Um, and I would always tell students that because it was like, get them excited about weaving. It's not just the labor of work, it has, connections to other cultures, to other ways of seeing and being, and the, the, the idea of this activity as having kind of spiritual resonance 
um, is, you know, it's just amazing. So, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question about linear time, but. Well, it got me thinking because, you know, I, I've seen work, you know, like Tommy Scanlon, who does the calendars, you know, and, and other people, but I always think of Tommy. And I've, you know, I've thought about, you know, how they mark time with their right. weaving. But I was just thinking, like you said, about I'm sitting and I'm weaving. And I never thought about that inch that I just did was a mark of time. Yeah. And the next inch will be, you know, and I have found that when I take something off the loom, I'll look at it and it'll make me recall something that happened in the past. Nothing earth shattering, but you know, yeah. I don't know. It's probably the obvious that I'm just now no. getting, but I think it's cool. So when I weave next, it'll be interesting to see how I feel and think about my warp as I'm I'm weaving. Yeah. So thank you yeah. for that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I love it. And I, again, it's those subtleties. It's those moments. Um, each insertion is a mark of time. And, uh, you know, I've, I've introduced some shifted weft ecot into my weavings from time to time. And I really love the shifted weft because it also makes you so cognizant of the, that next step. Um, and because you have to ad adjust the thread to make it move the way you want it to move. And so it, it emphasizes that kind of sense of accumulation and that, that marking of time even more directly. Um, and I think that, that that, you know, is really very profound. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think so much of what we do, even though we, we take it for granted um, or we, you know, wish we could rush through it because we want to get to the end and we want to see our weaving. Yep. Um, we have to remind ourselves that, you know, that's the dancing with the distance. That's making sure that you enjoy the entire journey of the warp and don't work to get rushed to get to the end. That's not the point. The point is watching each step along the way. Um, and, you know, I certainly don't do that all the time because I get impatient, but I do try to remind myself that, you know, that's, that's why I do it um, because I want to be part of that process and part of that experience. Well, you mentioned earlier about breaking the rigidity of your, of the structure of weaving, which is, you know, perpendicular, mm -hmm. horizontal, vertical, and you do that beautifully. And we've got some images of this. So was this something that you gradually started to work toward or was that a goal from you from the get-go of, of trying to break that rigidity? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I love the grid and I love the structure and the order, but doggone it, <laughs> I don't want that to be limiting in any way. So, you know, and you, you read about in, throughout history, um, again, the Coptic weavers, um, the, the uh, Syrian weavers, the Sustanian weavers, they would work with circles, rondelles. And, you know, there are theories as to why they worked with the circle, because, of course, again, it has all kinds of sim symbolic associations. But the other idea is that because it was such a challenge in a mm. circle is a challenge, right? Um, when you're working with the grid, uh, it's, it's hard to get a circle. Um, especially if you have a different amount of ends and a different amount of um, pits. So I like that challenge and I, I like the touch of the hand. So the mechanical aspect of the loom, the logic, the, the, the reason, I always wanted to balance with the rhyme or the intuition with the serendipity, something that is unpredictable versus something that is very controlled and predictable, the geometric against the fluid. So, uh, you know, it, it was a deliberate right from the start. And, and, you know, that's why working with weaver control processes, I never wanted to work with a pattern from edge to edge. It was the same. And even if, if you look at this weaving that's up there on the screen right now, you can see that the pattern transforms from the edge. It's much smaller and then it gets bigger. So I love playing with structure. I love working with what that will allow me to do, the geometry, the math of that. But then I, this actually has two layers of painted warp 
This is a warp rep weaving for, I love talking to weavers because some of you will probably understand what I'm saying, um, but it's a, it's a warp rep weaving. And I, I painted two layers of circles and then, you know, kind of wanted to bring them together with other circles that were woven in. Um, the shifting that occurs when you paint on the warp uh, it, it, you know, creates a different kind of edge than the mechanical geometry of the weave structure. So that is fascinating to me. Um, and so it's always been something of interest. I like shiny materials versus matte materials. I like th thick materials versus thin materials. I like painting versus geometry. So it's, it's all about, you know, those kind of dual dualities, um, you know, one thing reinforces the next. I I was struck by a picture I saw, we don't have it, but a picture I saw of you weaving and you were doing an inlay. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a juxtaposition. You have this machine that will just do it all for you. But yeah. like you said, you like to feel the hand, the, you know. Yeah that yeah. you're adding that. So yes. you're kind of the juxtaposition queen here. You like the straight, you like the circle, you yeah. like the machine, you like the hand. So that, that works well for you. That works well for you. Um, there, oh, and this is interesting too, is the teaching that you've done. And I wanna talk about that because I, I always hear from teachers how teaching impacts on their work in, some ways or others and so it was interesting because I read a review of one of your exhibits and the the guy who wrote the review said um, that this exhibit the work in this exhibit reflects on the intersection between her works as an artist and her works as a professor and I was like oh yes that's what I want to hear about so could you talk about all the teaching that you did um, at Kent State and elsewhere, um, how did that impact or change your artistic path? Well, it was very profound. Um, I you know, I would not be the weaver I am today if I had not been a professor at Kent State University and had the support of the administration really throughout my entire career there. Um, I, you know, I, I think probably one of the biggest impacts, of course, is working with the Jack Hart Loom, um, because this is a long time ago, back in probably the first time I put a request in to buy the digital, the um, TC1 um, from Digital Weaving Norway was in about 1998 or somewhere around in there, as soon as they became available. Of course, as a professor, you have to stay on top of things. So you're always reading about what's going on. What's the new technology? What are the new ideas? How are people thinking about textiles differently now? And, you know, you want to cover it all because you want to be able to respond to um, the interests of all the diverse students that come through the program. So I, I was so interested in this tool and I thought, well, we have to have one at Kent State. Well, you know, we don't have a lot of money. We're a public institution. And um, so it was a matter of, you know, kind of putting it on the list and hoping that something might happen. Um, the School of Fashion at Kent State University is, is internationally renowned. They're very highly ranked in terms of um, programs. Um, there aren't as many fashion programs as there are art programs. And they're a very good fashion program. And they also have a little bigger budget. Um, so I talked to the, the director of the School of Fashion at Kent State and I said, you know, boy, I'd really love to get this loom. She said, well, I'm going to put on my list um, to, you know, School of Art, School of Fashion. OK, great. I'm covered two bases. And I did this for several years. And then in uh, I think it was in the spring of 2001, the director of the School of Fashion called me and said, um, put your order in for that loom and I'm there oh my god <laughs> this is so thrilling and frightening because I had no idea how to use jack hard technology I had uh -huh. never used it before um and I didn't have any real personal aspirations at that point but doggone it I had to I had to you know do it and so I ordered the loom and that summer just again a perfect alignment of of uh, stars 
the Jacquard Center opened in North Carolina um, with Beth Ann Knudsen. And um, so I rushed down there to take a course in how to work with Jacquard. And we got the loom. I learned how to use it. And the rest is history. Um, it just, it changed my life. I loved it as a tool. It, it allows me to do all that I love to do and more. Um, it's a little more flexible. It's a little more, um, I, I will say expedient, but I don't use it in a real expedient kind of way. Um, so, you know, but it, 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 I would say it's definitely faster than working with my regular shaft loom. Um, so, you know, I have learned so many things. I mean, I had to learn how to do ECOT, so I could show my students how to do ECOT. And I did shifted weft ECOT, and I did warp ECOT. I learned how to do so many things because I, you know, I was young when I started teaching. And of course, we don't know a lot when we're young. Um, I didn't. Anyway, I had very minimal experience with textiles. Um, and I, so I just would learn and, you know, do what I could to stay ahead of the students. Um, if they had a question, it was like I'd run home and learn how to do something so that I could <laughs> respond to their question. And I am so grateful for that um, because it expanded my parameters enormously and, um, you know, again, allowed me to do so many things that, that I probably would never have done if I hadn't been teaching. Well, yay Kent State. Yeah, I'm just grateful. Yay Kent State. That's yeah. wonderful. Well, you had talked about how you incorporate different materials into your weaving. We're going to jump back to that. Mm -hmm. um, this next image shows some of that. We've got two different things. Um, the one on the right has, I know it has plastic in it and probably other things. And then the one on the left, um, this is a beautiful image because it shows you really can't see the metal um, as you're weaving in it. Um, so the one on the right, I have to ask, is that a rep weave? Yes. Oh, yes. I love that. Um, so, yeah. So why materials? Where did that come from? Well, again, I will blame it on my students um, because, and, and actually, you know, the history of textiles, uh, weavers are the most resourceful individuals in the world. I mean, why were baskets ever made? I mean, how were they ever made? It was because weavers were resourceful. They looked at what they had in the environment. They had branches or grasses or whatever, and they wove with them. Um, and so, you know, and, and rag rug weavers and quilters, um, you know, we've always used what is available. And I love that mentality. Um, so I would always challenge my students to use something that was ubiquitous to our culture, i.e. plastic, newspaper, um, uh, other kinds of, of paper or, you know, throwaway kinds of items. Um, because the idea of transforming that material was really interesting to me, taking something that is non-precious and making it precious through the act of, of making, of manipulating it. Um, and, you know, so I can't say you guys do this, but I'm not going to do it. So <laughs> of course I did it too. And I love doing it. Um, the plastic is just plastic bags that I had from my grocery store and I cut them up and wove into the, the warp wrap. You don't see the plastic except on the ends. And on this photograph, the edges are kind of cut off. But you, I mean, you see it very slightly and you see the shine of plastic, uh, you know, kind of coming through. Um, and actually the one on the, the left-hand side, it's not wire, it's monofilament. Um, oh, okay. A polymer, and this was a commission that I was working on for the um, Akron Polymer Research Institute. So I did, I used fishing line, that's what mm -hmm. that is. Um, fishing line is also a, an amazing material because it's stiff and it's shiny, um, but it does have kind of a mind of its own. It's a little more, it's different to use than wire. But, you know, I, I like the challenge of working with other materials and Interestingly enough, you know, telling my students to use materials that are in the um, in, ubiquitous to our culture, and some of the students have used in the past used newspaper, and of course they said, "Now you guys, now my students don't even know what newspaper is." Um, you know, it's like it's it's changed so much 
that those pieces are kind of historic now. I mean, they are really important because they were done with a material that is no longer in large circulation like it used to be. So I think that's really kind of interesting. Well, talking about the Akron Polymer Institute, right? Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to show an image from that, a piece that you did there. And I'm going to ask you about your use of color. Okay. Because you've talked some about it. And it sounds like you dye, you paint. Yeah. Um, you want to talk, uh, first of you want to talk about this piece, which is amazing. I wanted to show that image on the left just to get people an idea of the size of this. Yeah. It's yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, that was an exciting um, commission that I did for them. And the the patterns are actually, of course, they're my patterns with circles and lines, um, but they also kind of distort as they go down the length of the weaving. And that is kind of the way polymer is transformed, you know, how you make polymer, how you make plastic from these these molecules and um, you know it's interaction of those molecules that kind of come together and get mixed up and then they trans are transformed into this material. So I like that idea. I mean, it was so perfect for me because I think about that kind of sense of transformation and, and evolution. Um, so it, it, I was very much on the same wavelength as, uh, as the process of, of making polymer. Um, so, Yes, I paint my warps a lot of times. Uh, in this this instance, of course, it's just a, a gradient of color that I wanted to, you know, this was the, the space that I had to work with. This color was already on the walls. It was part of the architecture. So it was like, okay, how do I deal with that? Um, and I just wanted to get a sense of movement through color that emphasized also that transformation of structure, that movement through the, of the uh, um, lines and the shapes in the field. Um, so I think that, that that captures it. And and again, it's one of those ways of kind of breaking the rigidity. Um, so having a solid color warp, I very, very, I don't even remember. Oh, actually I do remember. I, I'm working with a solid color warp right now on my small loom. Um, but most of the time I paint my warps prior to putting them on the loom. Even if it's not a gradient, even if it's nothing specific, I will just create an atmospheric kind of movement of color um, with dye just because I don't want it to be so flat. I want it to have kind of a little bit more energy and reflect again, the kind of the touch of the hand. Yeah, it's just amazing. <laughs> I cannot imagine the work that went into making that huge thing. It's beautiful, so beautiful. Um, you've traveled to study um, at least a couple of places that were pretty impressive. You went to the Digital Weaving Norway, and I'm assuming that was for the TC2, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you also went to the Icelandic Textile Center. Yeah. yeah. So looking back on those times, how do you think they impacted or shifted your work by going there? Um, well, you know, Digital Weaving Norway, of course, is a little bit of a different animal that I was the first visiting artist. Um, I had oh, really, written, yeah, I had asked, oh. I had written to Viveka and I, uh, you know, we had already bought several looms from her for the, um, for Kent State University. We had the TC, two TC1s. And when the TC2 came out, of course, I wanted to try it. And I was actually in the market at that point for my own loom. Um, and so I wanted to try the TC2 and I wrote to Viveka and I said, you know, can I come over to Norway and, and um, try it? And she said, okay, fine. And we're going to start this, this uh, artist in residence program. And I, and I was the first one. So it was really exciting. And of course, to use the technology there at their um, wonderful kind of factory, their design center was amazing. Um, and of I loved it and you know then I bought one um and but it you know it's so inspiring to be in a new environment um and and I was the only person at Norway um but at Iceland of course there was a group of of artists there so you know it's conversation it's um seeing what other people are doing um it's allowing you to think maybe a little bit more outside the box i i developed some new strategies for designing drawing um when i was there just because it, it's so different um the nature is so pervasive um 
And since I'm always out in nature, I mean, I really notice the difference, but you notice it even when you're inside because the wind and I mean, it, it's just amazing. So those kinds of experiences are just invaluable, but primarily it, it it's not about a, a change right away. It's more of a, a matter of, you know, filtering through your other ideas and distilling. And over time, uh, I think those, sometimes those experiences come to, to the fore more dramatically than they do like the day you get home. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, I get it, I get it, yeah. Well, um, I could keep asking you questions all day, but <laughs> let me ask you one and then we're gonna go to questions. So what's next for you? What's the next big thing? Book, travel, new weaving technique? Um, Underlying book. I, I'm not going to write a book, no. Um, I, although there is a really lovely catalog that accompanies the exhibition um, that I, the Dancing with the Distance, uh, with a couple of really nice es essays from Marianne Fairbanks and from Shana Klein um, and uh, the curator um, Sarah Hume. Um, but the uh, I actually am immersed in a new commission. I have a commission on the loom right now for a client in Pittsburgh. And I am working diligently on a proposal for a, another commission, which is for um, a, an institute in Wisconsin. And uh, I really hope I get it. Of course, you know, I'm one of several artists who will have their work reviewed, um, but I'm working really hard because I would love to get uh, the, have the opportunity to work with some larger work. Um, and this commission is a large, large piece. Mm -hmm. And um, so it would be larger than the Akron piece. And uh -huh. I'm you know, really excited about that. And, and I love the idea of doing commission work because it means that you know, you're gonna make something and it's gonna go out and, and it's gonna live somewhere. Um, and rather than being rolled up and in your studio waiting for another show to come up. Um, so it's, that to me is, is what I wanna keep doing. Well, we all have our fingers crossed for you. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's do look at some questions because we got a bunch. Okay. Oh, get good. through as many as we can. Okay. Um, oh my gosh. Hi, uh, hey, Janice. I was wondering what sort of companies you've worked with in the past and what sort of companies you suggest for textiles majors looking for a job career after school. We miss you in the studio. Hopefully you'll come by and visit us sometime soon. Ren Enders. Oh, Ren. Hi, Ren. Um, yeah, well, that's a tough question, of course, because it's, it's always, it's evolving and changing. And my advice to students in terms of, of looking for companies is to, um, just kind of put your feelers out and see what happens. Um, I I have never worked for um, any design companies personally. I went right from graduate school to teaching, um, and but a number of my students have. And Ren, talk to me personally, and I will put you in touch with some people um, so that you know maybe they would have some um, ideas about where you might kind of uh, submit your resume. And, um, you know, we have an internship at Kent State too with uh, perennials weaving in, um, in Texas and they've been really kind of generous with our students. And, uh, you know, those kinds of opportunities are really great because they provide a really nice springboard for some of them to go on and continue working in industry. Um. Ramona Abernathy Payne would like to know what sort of loom do you work on? You have a couple, right? A couple of looms? Well, you know, I used to work on my make homer looms. I love make homer looms and can we have a lot of make homer looms at school um, because that's where I taught and everything we bought was a make homer. Um, and uh, so I had a 72 inch wide make homer loom with 16 shafts. It was a Compu Dobby. And then I also had an eight shaft um, make homer loom, which I was kind of the first loom that I invested in. Um, and I love those looms. I also had an arm loom and a European loom, a 24 shaft Compu Dobby. It was, only, it was ra rather narrow, like 22 inches wide. That loom was a really nice loom too, the arm looms. 
Um, and, and, but I had to get rid of them, you know, when I got my TC2s because you only have so much space in the world. And so I had to sell my other looms and I do miss them. I love my looms and I love working with shaft looms, um, but I love my Jack Lords too. And they just seem to be, you know, perfect for me now at, at this stage in my life. Um. Alice Schlein. Hi, Alice is Hi, watching. Alice. And she wants to know what is the metal in the warp? And I think you answered that. Um, or do you put metal in the warp? No, I don't put in metal the in the warp. Yeah. I only, I use silk primarily in the warp and mostly because silk is much easier to rinse than cotton. Um, and if you're <laughs> going to paint on cotton, of course, or linen, I never really use cotton, but I use linen. Oh, the rinsing would take forever. So as I was telling the students the other day, the one thing I, I have less energy now as I'm older, but I do have a little bit more money. So I buy silk warp and I work with silk warp because it's easier to rinse. I love the reflective quality of it, but mm -hmm. I, it would be really hard to use metal in uh, a jacquard loom. It would be very difficult to thread and I'm not really up to that. I used to use metal in the warp occasionally, and I used to use monofilament in the warp occasionally, and I love the way those things work, but it's just too hard to, um, to think about doing it on the Jacquard loom. And it's monofilament that is the shiny. It's not really metal, right? Well, some of the time the shine is coming from the monofilament and some of its times it's coming from the metal. It, they oh, both okay. have that same luminosity. The thing I like about the metal is, of course, is that it's opaque. And with the uh, monofilament, the, the thing about that um, commission piece that I did was I, I use monofilament and a, um, a black linen because you can't mm. see the monofilament, you know? So how do you see the pattern if you have a transparent weft in there? So I needed to have something that was gonna, you know, print and make the, the pattern apparent. And, and so I had to put another string in with the monofilament. I could have dyed the monofilament, but I'm not sure about the longevity of dyeing polymer. Um, I've done a few tests and, you know, I just, I just don't know. So it's more of a question. Um, Jane Einstein wants to, Eisenstein wants to know what software do you use in your TC2? I design exclusively with Photoshop. And when I was at Kent State, of course, I had the privilege of working with the Poincaré software. And I would use that uh, for some of the weavings. But I, the way I work, um, working with Photoshop is really the easiest thing to do. So, um, and now I don't have any options. So that's what I use, it's great. Somebody wants to know what kind of dyes are you using for your warp and weft? Just MX Pro Chem dyes um, for both. Uh, really, I dye the silk with the MX um, dyes and, uh, and also, yeah, all the wefts. I don't use any, I mean, I use protein at the silk, but you can use MX on, on silk. So that's, that's pretty much what I use. Um, what, oh, how large of a piece are you able to weave on the jacquard loom? The width, of course, is, has, you know, provides the limits. Um, mm -hmm. And that's 58 inches on my large loom and about 14. It's a little over 58 and a little over 14 for my small loom. Um, and then, of course, I can just keep on weaving so I can make really long pieces. And the commission proposal that I'm working on now, I'm planning to put two weavings together. Um, and I've you know, done that in the past. And so you can create much larger works. It's a little tricky sometimes because of beading, of course, we all know that. Um, but I you know, think it's, it's worth um, working on um, and, and kind of trying to control because it, it will allow me to expand in that direction as well. Well, Cindy Walker wants to know, did you study under Janet Taylor at Kent State? No, I was never a student at Kent State. I just came here as a faculty. Um, and, you know, I don't remember when Janet was here. She was not, you know, she actually was no longer in the area. 
when I was when I came on board, I replaced another faculty who had been a, a kind of a, a um, temporary faculty. Um, and so I did not work with her. I know of her, I know her work, and I know a couple people that worked with her when she was here and certainly enjoyed working with her and learning from her and, and, and really developed some great work of their own. Um, Ch Chad Troyer wants to know, what is your favorite weave structure to use? <laughs> Chad, hi Chad. Um, Chad was a former student of mine doing really well right now. And I am, uh, let's see, I, I don't know that I have a favorite. I love the waffle weave structure because of its depth and, uh, you know, tactility. But is there anything that can top a twill? Um, I love the, the movement of, you know, the diagonals and you can work with a point and you can change the relationships of your twill weave so that you have you know different kinds of warp and weft coverage and you know it's very structurally sound so i i just i love the twill too all right i'm, I'm going to embarrass myself here this is from patrice george she goes i love your references to cesarean and sogdian textiles yes the same even remotely well. close yeah you are <laughs> thank you she yeah. said did you study textile history um patrice yeah thank you um i know again that was one of my things that when i you know i went to school in the 70s and um i know patrice has been around for a while a while so she can probably also relate to the fact that back in the 70s man we just did our own thing right um and if you wanted to learn how to weave you taught yourself how to weave um, I, I'm exaggerating a little bit. I did go to the University of Michigan at, for graduate school and Sherry is an amazing weaver. Um, but it was, I'm largely self-taught and my textile history is very, uh, you know, again, it's not deep, it's shallow and, and broad. Um, I love textile history, but, and I, I needed to introduce textile history to my students because I thought it was really important. Um, so I, did the reading that I had to do just so that I knew enough that I was introducing them to the incredible world of textile history. And I would always say, you know, well, you guys, if, if you find something that you love, you've got to explore it in more depth because this is just tip of the iceberg here. Um, I and, 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 you know, Cleveland Museum of Art has fabulous textile, historic textile. So, you know, I take my students to the um, museum and I got to learn a lot from um, uh, from visiting the the, uh, the work there, and you know, it's just when you get to be a certain age, of course, you do find that you've accumulated a lot of information. <laughs> so there are some advantages <laughs> to getting um, older. Well, you get a shout out here. Love your work. I just got back from Ohio and sadly wasn't able to make your exhibit at no. Kent. Congratulations. Great memories of studying with you. A 1989 graduate. And that's from Sherry Davis. Oh, isn't that sweet? Thank you, Sherry. That's lovely. I'm so sorry that you didn't get to see the show or stop in and visit me, but thanks for saying so. It's good to have you watching, Sherry. Can't believe it. It's time. Oh. It's been an hour. How did we do this? Kathy, you were great. I loved your questions. Um, and I am and just so grateful to, again, have had this opportunity. Thank you to the um, Illinois um, Prairie Weavers. That was so generous of you to support this hour. Um, HGA, it's amazing that you've been doing this and connecting weavers. It's fabulous to talk to weavers. Um, as I said, to mention, to be able to communicate and say things that a regular general audience would say, huh? Um, so this is, this has been a real pleasure for me and thank you so much. Well, thank you, Janice. We, we're going to miss you as, as not being at Kent State. We loved working with you and your students and, uh, we hope the the, uh, tradition will continue and we'll still yeah. have students from Kent State at Convergence, but I'm so glad to see you're doing more of your work and I really hope I can go see your exhibit. Thank uh, you. Let me know, Kathy. And again, I want to extend that invitation. I am serious. If anybody wants to come up and wants a walkthrough, let me know. Email me. You can find my email on my website. It's just jlesman at kent.edu. And I would meet you at the museum and um, talk to you about the work. There you go. 
We do want to thank our um, sponsor and it um, for stepping up and being a, a, ho a sponsor of this episode. You had a good one, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it. Illinois Prairie Weavers Guild since 1949. That's amazing. Good job on Illinois Prairie Weavers. Thank you so much. So if you or someone you know or your business or your guild would like to be a sponsor, please go to our website at weavespindie.org and you too can be a sponsor of Textiles and Tea. Thank you to all of our, our uh, wonderful sponsors. Um, if you would like to learn more about Janice, I think I just skipped this, sorry. If you'd like to learn more from Janice, um, Janice, is this also a good place for you for our folks to go? JaniceLesman-Moss.com? Oh, I think she's gone. Anyway, uh, that's her website. You can go to her website and see all of her gorgeous work. She has a beautiful website. You can see all this beautiful work and um, check out all the things that um, is on there. We do want to thank everybody for sponsoring um, our 100 donations of $100 by our 100th episode. It will be November the 29th, and we will have a very special guest for that episode. So we uh, encourage you all, if, you, if you've ever thought about donating to support Textiles and Tea, come join us. It's kind of fun. It's kind of a, a nice game to play right now. We're excited that we're doing our 100th episode. Who can believe it? Um, when we started, we thought if we did 10, it would be a great day. And if 30 people showed up, we'd be tickled pink. So we're excited that it's continued. So come join us. $100 um, donation to the Fiber Trust will help us get to our 100 donations by our 100th episode. Thank you all so much. If you've, uh, we got spinning and weaving coming up, folks. It's amazing. It's next week. Monday, starting Spinning and Weaving Week. If you haven't signed up for it, if you haven't registered for it yet, please do so. It's a great uh, week for the money that you pay. We've got, um, we've got panels. We've got people talking about their work. We've got uh, tours to the artist studios. Those are always fabulous. You're going to love those. Um, we have vendors who are going to be there and they're going to show us their products, new stuff, new fibers. We always like to see that. So come join us. And where's my fashion so show participants? I need my fashion show participants. Strut your stuff and you can do it from home. It's easy. So if you've uh, woven something that you're kind of proud of, I don't care if it's a dish towel. Um, Susie did a, a beach towel the last time. So Bring out your stuff and let's see it. We want to show off what we've been doing um, the last couple of years. So join us on the um, Strut Your Stuff fashion show that's online for Spinning and Weaving Week. Um, if you've missed any of the episodes, you can watch them. Uh, you can watch them on Facebook. You can go to YouTube. And I encourage you to sign up to subscribe to the YouTube channel, the HGA YouTube channel, because if you do, you will get a notice when one is uploaded. And I think we're getting pretty close to being caught up. It takes a while to get those up. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Janice. What a lovely hour of uh, talking with you. Hope you all have a wonderful week. Next week, we have Avancia, I'm probably pronouncing his name so bad, Venancia Aragon. Beautiful tapestry work, rug work. Wait till you see him. It's great stuff. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you next Tuesday. Happy tea.